you got a chance to kind of talk through some of the story about Daniel. And uh, so if you were, you've been going through with us in church right now, uh, we have been going through uh, the book of Daniel. So today we started in, uh, yesterday, last week we started in Daniel chapter 1, made it through the first seven verses. And here we are in chapter 1, looking at verses 8 through 21. Um, so if you were not, um, if you were not with us uh, last, uh, or today, in person, we had a little bit of an interesting thing with our internet that uh, has been happening. It, you know what's crazy? It always happens right when I come up to preach. So, uh, pff, Wi-Fi goes out, internet goes out, right when I preach. But here I am, and I'm going to do this for you guys. So what I'd like to do is just kind of talk through the story with you guys and uh, go through uh, some of the stuff from the book of Daniel that you might have missed if you were trying to watch online, and then I'll post this to YouTube as well. So here we are as we start talking about our book of Daniel. Just a little bit of context um, is that this is 900 miles. They've gone from Jerusalem right here. This is where they're at right here, and they've made their 900-mile journey. Now, this is Google Maps, and it probably would not have taken the Google Maps uh, drive, but it's about 900 miles of what the journey would have actually been. Um, and uh, so here they are. Remember, you've got these youth that are in the area. They've gone to Babylon, uh, and they have been brainwashed. Remember, 605 is when this happens, uh, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, comes, takes this group of young people. He'll come back in 597 uh, and take the king and people like Ezekiel. 586, he'll destroy Jerusalem. So uh, this is what we see right here, is that for, this is 21 years before the destruction of the temple, uh, but right now, um, or 19 years before the destruction of the temple, and then, um, but right now we're in the 605 time frame. Now remember, uh, Daniel and his friends have been brought to Babylon, and they've changed their names, they have... Um, they, they have not only have changed their names, uh, from, but the important thing is that they're trying to do is to try to turn them to become uh, Babylonian and kind of get away from being Jewish. So here we are in our story now. We find ourselves in verse 8, and here's what it says. Let me get my face out of here. Uh, Daniel determined that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank, so he asked permission from the chief eunuch not to defile himself. So let's look at these words here because uh, this idea right here of defile and um, right here is is one that we look at. And this is this is what Daniel is looking at. He's looking at this and he's saying, um, you know, look, I don't I don't want to defile or pollute myself is what those words mean. Now, the king's food, by the way, this would have been luxurious. This is the best of the best. He had a, a great um, chef, so to speak. And, um, and so this is what the king's food is. They're getting the best of the best. And Daniel says, I don't want to defile myself. Well, what's that all about? Why is Daniel concerned about defilement? You know, what, what, why is it that he says, I'm not going to eat that? Now, some might say, as you kind of read a little bit more, because he's going to ask for vegetables only. Some would say, well, okay, Daniel realizes that he wasn't supposed to do anything, but he's going to be a vegetarian. And that's what God really wanted for us. In fact, I've had many conversations. People always try to tell me that the Bible uh, is what God only really intended us to eat vegetables. Uh, that's not here. In fact, uh, Daniel's problem is not that he eats, is that, that, that this is uh, not vegetarianism. Uh, Daniel's problem is, is a little bit deeper than this. Here's one of the main problems that we see uh, is that uh, Daniel's problem is, first off, that it's not kosher. Um, now, this is a modern-day kind of Jewish approach to kosher, but you'll see, if you were to look in your Bible to uh, Leviticus 11, uh, if you were to look at uh, Deuteronomy um, 14, that this is what would be considered kosher or not kosher. Um, and so Daniel is probably looking at this and saying, I, I desire to be ceremonially clean. Kosher versus not kosher is to be ceremonially clean uh, would have been uh, that in those days, if you lived in Israel, that you were able to go and approach the temple and worship. So Daniel's desire is to carry this on to make sure that he doesn't eat unclean things, but he stays clean. Now, there's another part of this, too, is it could be even deeper than that. It could be, go beyond ceremonially to moral. 
in that um, in Babylonian times, they would have sacrificed things to idols. The king would have had a great sacrifice to his idols, and then he would have brought uh, the, the meats and all of those things that he sacrificed to them and brought it before the people. And so Daniel could be having grounds of which he's saying, I don't want to participate because I'm not going to eat these things. These have been sacrificed to idols. You know, the early church went through this same problem. Uh, you'll actually hear from Apostle Paul. If you look at 1 Corinthians 10, um, verses 25 through 28, he, he talked to the people about how uh, it, they, they needed to not worry about those things. Don't ask questions when you go to the marketplace um, and, uh, and worry about that. But early church had a lot of problems of, should I eat these things if they've been sacrificed to idols or not? Um, especially if they've come out of that. So Daniel doesn't want to defile himself uh, with this food. Now notice what else it says. God granted Daniel kindness and compassion for the chief eunuch, and yet he said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who has assigned your food and drink. What if he sees your faces looking thinner than the other men your age? You would endanger my life with the king. Now, a couple of things to look at in the text. So first off, notice this. God granted kindness. I can't draw straight lines, never have, and compassion. Um, this is really cool because what this is saying is that God is over the heart of this chief individual. This guy who's running the court and going to present these guys to the king, God's in control of their heart, his heart. In fact, Daniel probably hasn't known him that long, and yet what God has done is made it to where this man is receptive to the words of Daniel. He's receptive to the things Daniel's going to ask. God is over the heart. In fact, Proverbs tells us this. Proverbs 21, verse 1 says, The king's heart is like channeled water in the Lord's hand. He directs it wherever he wants to go, wherever he chooses. Um, and, and so what we need to know is that God is in control of all situations. God is in control of the heart. And God is taking these convictions that Daniel and his friends have and he is going to present them in such a way to where the, the, the eunuch will at least be receptive to the request, not angry about it. I mean, because there's a lot riding on this. Daniel and them could be, could get, uh, there could be a lot that could happen. I mean, you think about even today, to stand up for your convictions. Today in 2020, if you have a conviction that's something other than somebody of the mainstream, uh, you're touted as, as somebody who is, uh, how could you dare have a different opinion? You know, we don't have room for that anymore. Um, that, that, you're, that you're declaring that the food that we're eating, that we're bad people for some reason. And Daniel has a lot of writing on this of, as he's making this request. Um, but yet we find that God granted compassion and kindness um, towards Daniel in this pagan eunuch's life. Okay. Now, what does he fear? He says, I fear... My Lord, the King, he's afraid for his life. Why? Because if he sees your faces looking thinner, that word thinner just means uh, it's like uh, it's the same word that is used of uh, the two men in the jail cell uh, with Joseph in the story of Joseph. Uh, they couldn't have their dreams interpreted. So they're, they're these really terrible looking faces. Um, distraught is what it looks for, looks like. And he says, what if you look thinner than all the other young men your age? Uh, and he goes, would you endanger my life with the king? And this is literally make my head guilty, meaning he's worried that the king would chop his head off if he screws this up. Uh, and so Daniel is, is there to say, uh, you know, look, please grant us this. But the guy said, look, if I could lose my job, I could lose my life if this goes wrong. Okay, so at least he's receptive. Now, we're not sure if he goes along with it, but we do know that Daniel and the guard make a deal. Daniel said to the guard, whom the chief eunuch had assigned to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servant for 10 days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then examine our appearance and the appearance of the young men who are eating at the king's food and deal with your servants based on what you see. Okay, um, this is, this is interesting. He gives him this, this challenge. Test us for 10 days. Give us only fruits. Give us only veggies. Uh, and, and that word vegetables, by the way, is something from the seed, meaning it's sprouted out from the seed. And uh, so it, it could be vegetables, grains, veggies, seeds, things like that. Nuts. Only give us that for 10 days and see how things turn out. Now, here's the thing. When we read this today, what typically takes place is our minds go to things uh, like uh, like the Daniel plan, the Daniel diet. 
But let's, let's look at what actually took place and then we'll critique this. It says he agreed with them about this and he tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, they were looking better and healthier um, than all the young men who were eating the king's food. So the guard continued to remove their food and their wine and they were, uh, and that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. Now, let me just stop here for just a second. By the way, this, this vegetarianism that Daniel has, uh, it's temporary. By chapter 10, we find out that as he has been uh, eating, uh, that he has, uh, he's mourning. And he says this in chapter 10, verse 2 and 3. I, Daniel, was mourning for three full weeks. I didn't eat any rich food uh, or, or meat or wine entered my mouth. And I didn't put any oil on my body until three weeks were over. So it seems like at least by chapter 10, uh, Daniel has his own chef. He's got his own food, all of that. He's eating meat, drinking wine, eating all the delicacies. But it's probably according to his own standards at this point. Now, so remember, he's not advocating vegetarianism. Now, what happens, though, is when we read this text, we get so lost in the diet plan. And we, we don't really think this is a miraculous story. This is supposed to be miraculous. You know, when we think about this story, we get all caught up in, in this. And we start to think, okay, well, maybe this is God's plan for all of us to eat healthy. And so you think about the Daniel plan. You think about the Daniel diet. Think about, okay, we're going to do veggies and, and all of that. And the truth is, hey, look, all of us could probably benefit, me included, 10 days of just veggies and wine. Okay? All of us could. This is not the point, though. The point is not, oh, they ate veggies, and oh, look how great they look. In fact, let me go back to the text. I'm going to show you something, okay? The point is, it says that they, at the end of the days, they look better and healthier than the young men who were eating them. So when we read this, right, we look at this. This means good, they're handsome, and this means healthier than all the young men. Now, that's how we translate it in English, okay? If you were to translate this in the original, healthier is not the word that should be there. In fact, what is in there actually is this, more literally, fatter of flesh. You see, what was miraculous about the Daniel diet, the original Daniel diet, is we read it like this and say, oh, isn't it great? They ate tens of vegetables and they look so good. That is not what was miraculous about this story. They ate tons of vegetables and they drank water and now they were fatter than everybody else. I love the movie Wally. But this is what the king wanted. He wanted his people to be larger. Uh, in fact, here's a quote about ancient Near Eastern peoples at that time. It comes from a guy uh, who I studied under named Tremper Longman, and, and I studied in wisdom literature. I took a class with him. And here's what he says. Uh, when we look at the, the low reliefs that have been recovered from archaeological excavations in Mesopotamia, meaning those stone carved out images, right? Um, that we see men depicted in two ways. Uh, one, the king is a warrior. Uh, the king and the warrior class are indeed bristling with muscles. And on the other hand, wise men like Daniel and his colleagues are pictured as bald, big-eyed, a symbol of intelligence, and chubby. That is the look that Nebuchadnezzar was going for. You see, what those men were supposed to look like is the food that they were eating was supposed to make them fatter. Because then, in that culture, if you were fatter, it would show you're well taken care of, you're wealthy, you're part of nobility, uh, you're, you could afford to eat. And so the, the concern was, if I give you guys only vegetables, you ain't going to be fat. But Daniel has stuck to his convictions, and his desire was to please God and to not go down this road of eating pagan food or non-kosher food. That, that they say, test us in this. And so the blessing and the miracle is, at the end of 10 days, they're fatter than everybody else. That is the true Daniel diet. So look, is it okay? Should we be eating vegetables? Sure. Do we want this diet in particular? Well, the way that it played out, probably not. Look, I know how to gain weight in 10 days. I can eat a lot and gain weight, and I'm sure everybody else did. But it seems like the way that God was over this, they gained all the weight and didn't have to, didn't have to give up their convictions to be able to do it. Now look at this last part. This is pretty fascinating. It says this, God gave these four men knowledge and understanding in every kind of literature and wisdom. Now here's what is fascinating here. Check this out. God gave these men knowledge and understanding. 
in every kind of literature and wisdom. Here is what's crazy about this. If you look at verse 4 of chapter 1, we found out that these were men already who were selected because they were intelligent. They were selected because they were able to learn, right? This was the whole point, is that these were guys who were smart. They were able to get it. The text is telling us that God was the one who gave them all the knowledge and understanding. Here's what the text is meaning. God is over their education, which is fascinating because what that is saying is these guys have, are going through this re-education process. They're to take them and to make them as Babylonian and as pagan as possible, forget their Jewish ways, but God is over the process. So no matter how much they're trying to ingrain in them Babylonian myth and legend, uh, religion, history, all of this, and make them forget that God is over this process. So they're hearing all of this, but yet what we're going to find out is it's not going to stick, and their convictions that they were given at a young age that have stayed with them is what's going to keep them through. And so that's what happens, is God is over the education process. He's been guiding them through, helping them probably to see where all these other viewpoints fall apart. Um, Daniel also understood visions and dreams of every kind. We can talk about that another time. I could make a few videos if you would like at some point, church family, about dreams. That's my area that I was studying in uh, under my doctor is the dreams and visions part, but we'll talk about that another time. Um, at the end of the time, the king said, in, uh, said uh, the, that the king had said to present them, the chief eunuch presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king interviewed them, and among all of them, no one was found equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah. So they began to attend the king. So here is what's fascinating. They're presented before the king. He interviews them, talks to them. He's obviously going to be asking them questions about the things that they've learned. If they're going to be part of these wise men, right, they're going to be in there. Uh, he's going to ask them questions about the things they've learned, about all that literature and all that stuff. He's going to ask them, how good are they? And remember what the text tells us right here. It says that as he interviewed them, he found that there was no one who was equal. Okay? No one who's equal. They're better than everybody else. They're, more, they're smarter. They got it all. Their wisdom is great. And it says, so they began to attend the king. Now, here is what is fascinating. When you begin to understand who they're attending the king with, let me show you the next verse here in here. So as he is consulting them, it says, in every matter of wisdom and understanding that the king consulted them about, he found them 10 times better than the magicians and the mediums in his kingdom. Here's what this word means. This is sorcerer. Magicians is sorcerers. These are the same people. They're not pulling rabbits out of hats. They're, they're doing dark occult magic. You see that's the same word they use of those guys in Egypt. And then you've got this, the mediums here. These are people who speak to the dead, the necromancers. Uh, they're involved with the spirits. So Nebuchadnezzar is lumping these men in. Daniel and Hananiah, they're spending their time. This is their crew. Their crew is this. I mean, I've said it's, it's like that he's now placed them on faculty at Hogwarts. This is who they live amongst. This is who they belong to, this whole bunch of people. They're a bunch of witches and sorcerers, and Nebuchadnezzar has now lumped them in. They know the stuff. They know about the text. They know about the books. What we're going to find, though, as you read through, is they have not been poisoned by this stuff. In fact, Daniel, no matter how much they've had thrown at them, they're going to stick to their convictions. You know, I mean, think about this. They were willing to stick to their convictions over food. Do you think that they're willing to give that all up now that they have their job? If you read the words of Deuteronomy, in chapter 18, God specifically calls out the stuff that these people are doing. Here's what he says in verse 18, verses 9 through 14. When you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you, don't imitate the detestable customs of those nations. No one among you is to sacrifice his son or daughter in the fire, practice divination, tell fortunes, interpret omens, practice sorcery, cast spells, consult a medium or a spiritist or inquire of the dead. Everyone who does these acts is detestable to the Lord. And the Lord your God is driving you out of these nations before you uh, because of these detestable acts. You must be blameless before the Lord your God. Though these nations you're about to drive out listen to the fortune tellers and diviners, uh, the Lord your God has not permitted you to do this. So here's what we find, right? Daniel has been placed with these guys. This is his world that he lives in. And, but God has protected them through the process. 
Remember, God has been over their education. God has been over the hearts of the people putting them in place. God has helped them to stand even in the small, and now he's going to help them to stand even in these much larger cases. But notice what we also find here in the text, too, is that Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. You know what that means, guys? Is This is 70 years of his life doing this. 70 years of his life will be spent on faculty, so to speak, with these people. 70 years of his life with all of this kind of stuff going around. These are the people. This is the stuff that he's going to be doing. His world is this. But here's what we know, okay? Here's what we know about the text. There's a couple of things, just some major points we need to bring back. First off, I need to ask you this. Think about their convictions, right? God is going to keep them through it, but he, and he's going to bless them. But where did their convictions come in the first place? Where? Well, their convictions came from, really, from from somewhere. It wasn't just something out of thin air. They, they just decided. They had to have known the Torah. They had to have known the Word of God. Who taught them the Word of God? They didn't have Sunday school. They didn't have vacation Bible school. They didn't have kids programs to teach them in Israel. Who taught them these things? Well, I'll tell you who taught them these things. It was, it was probably the family. If you think about this, the, the book of Deuteronomy tells us that, that it's the job of the family to, to raise up children in the Lord. You think about what that would look like, and here's what he says in the book of Deuteronomy. He tells the families, he says that they're to, uh, to, to speak about these, uh, uh, when, repeat them to your children, talk about them when you sit in your house, and when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up, bind them as a sign on your hand, let them be a symbol on your forehead, write them on the doorposts of your house and on your city gates. This is what they're supposed to do. They were to, to, to speak these truths to their children day in and day out. That's what this is about. These convictions came from the Word of God, and their families must have been pushing that into them every day, day in and day out. What I want to show you, by the way, is something that we are about to do. We're about to launch a brand new challenge for this church. And there's a book that we're going to offer families to be involved with and to help with. And here's what I want you to look at. It's, it's a book called Cornerstones. And, um, and, and here is what the book is. Uh, it's a book called Cornerstones, and we're going to give you guys. But our challenge is, is not a book. Our challenge is called the 30-30 Challenge. And what we want to do is we want families to take it seriously for 30 days, starting in August 30, all the way to September 30, to go 30 minutes a week. 30 minutes a week where you'll use this book, Cornerstones, use this one, and we'll show you more. We'll post links to it soon enough. Use a book like this, and what we want you to do is to ask your kids questions about it. We'll put links in the subscription all in at the bottom here, too. Um, talk to them. Treat, take 30 minutes throughout the week to just talk to them about the Bible. Adults, maybe you don't have kids at home. Maybe you're single. Maybe you're not married. Uh, you don't have any kids. We have another program we're going to ask for you to do on the 30-30 challenge too, which is just to continue to grow in the knowledge of God. But our convictions need to come from the Word of God, guys. Our convictions need to come as we're raised up in God's Word. That's where we need to, to, to get it from. And that's where we're challenging our people is grow in this. And then watch what God will do with that. It's very similar to what we see in the book of Proverbs, right? And the book of Proverbs tells us, in 22, verse 6, it says, Start a youth on his way, and even when he grows old, he won't depart from it. Now, that's not a promise to say if you do this, it's going to always end up that way, but it's a generally good thing that if you raise your child in the Lord, if you make that a priority, they will be, it'll be well for them in the end. So our challenge is to keep that up. Our challenge is to, is to, um, is to, to continue to in, uh, build in your children, in your grandchildren, a love for God's Word, convictions from God's Word. Not from your words, but from God's Word. So we want to challenge you guys to take the 30-30 challenge. Now, the other thing we want to say is this, is the last thing is here. In this text, too, we see that convictions are important. God's going to challenge us. We're going to have times where, we're, you know, the world will challenge us, and God's going to be with us through it all, but we'll have times where we be to be, are we going to be willing to hold these convictions all the way to the end? Can you hold them in small things? Can you hold them in little things? We're challenged to do that. Will you hold your biblical convictions? Or will you give them up with the pressure that comes? And the last question is this, or the last thing to think about is this, is notice how God is in control of the whole situation. He's in control of the hearts of the eunuch who 
allows their request to be made. He's in control of Daniel and his friends and their education through it all. And so we think about that. The truth is that the, the gospel is something that we know um, is, 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 uh, is, is something as well that needs to understand that God's in control of the hearts as the gospel is heard. And so when you think about the gospel, Paul tells us in the gospels as well that people read the, uh, when they hear the gospel, it's, a veiled, it's veiled to them. In fact, here's what he says. Uh, he says this. He says, if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled because those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers and keeps them from seeing the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ. Who is the image of God? For we are not proclaiming ourselves, but Jesus Christ as, as Lord, uh, and ourselves as servants of Jesus' sake. For God said, let the light shine out of the darkness, has shown in our hearts to give light and knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ. So here's the deal, guys. The gospel is something that we know is that people are blinded by by the gospel. They don't know. They can't understand because the, the, the God of this world, Satan, has blinded their minds. But we should be praying that God would grab a hold of hearts and have them hear the gospel and understand it. We should be praying that God would free people, that when the gospel is shared, that they would, the blinds are gone, they finally understand. So when we become evangelistic, we need to be praying for God to open minds and hearts. And who knows? Don't prejudge the situation say they'd never understand, they'd never get it. Pray that God would open minds and hearts and go with that. Okay, my prayer is that if you don't know the Lord and you're watching this, that your eyes would be open to the truth of the gospel, that you would be understanding that Jesus took your punishment upon himself, that he was killed in your place because you can't stop sinning, but yet God placed all the punishment and guilt on him, and you could take Jesus' perfect record and stand freely before the Lord in judgment one day because now you have Jesus' perfect record and he took your imperfect record, do you want that? Our prayer is that your eyes would be open to that. The veil would be dropped. God would open your heart to that. And if you guys know people who don't know the Lord, I, I, my prayer is that you'd be praying for them, that the, the, the veil is gone and they'd be able to see and understand the gospel. All right. Hold on to those convictions. Hold on to what you know about the Lord in these times and talk to your family. Share this. Be disciple makers. Guys, I'm going to put video probably throughout this week. Talk about the 30-30 challenge. We'll give you more information soon enough. Okay, talk to you later. Have a happy Sunday.